Peggy was always a great inspiration to me, but I did find her somewhat challenging because she was very beautiful and uh, she used to steal my boyfriends from me <laughs> so that <laughs> there was always a sense of sort of rivalry there because they become so enamored of Peggy in her wheelchair. Peggy was born with an indomitable spirit that certainly would be challenged in her lifetime. Just as she was starting to walk, it was discovered she had been born without proper hip sockets. She was operated on and had to lie on her back with legs in cast, splayed at right angles to her body and slowly brought back to normal position. Quite a challenge for a two-year-old. Was this a portent of what was to come? As soon as Peggy could hold a pencil, she liked to draw. She preferred her own hand-drawn paper dolls and created a stylish outfits for them. Despite her bad hips, as a teen, Peggy loved to ride horseback and rode after the hounds on the Tacoma Prairie. This explains her early drawings of horses and learning their anatomy, which was a big benefit in her later paintings. Our family of five children grew up in Tacoma, which actually was often thought of as an outpost of Seattle. But actually, Tacoma had probably the biggest lumber barons in the Northwest living there. And they all lived out in the Lakes District of Tacoma, where our home was. In today's society and art world, it seems politically incorrect to admit coming from an all-white, privileged background. Well, Peggy came from just that. Her challenges did not come from economic or social hardship. They came from very personal circumstances. We lived amongst wealthy, conservative people, but Mother was always different. She had that grounded sense of democracy, which she passed on to all of her children. Our father, a civil engineer, built railroads for the timber companies and many highways in the Northwest. The family often spent summers in the wild in his construction camps. Living so close to nature as we grew up, we all learned to love and revere it. I was sent to public school, but Peggy was sent to private school, the Annie Wright Seminary, where she would get more intense instruction in art. Peggy went on to pursue a career in art at the University of Washington. She certainly could create abstract art, but found more satisfaction in figurative painting and particularly portraiture. She also found she could make money painting her friends and acquaintances. So, by the age of 20, she had saved enough to head for art school in Paris. She was to catch a ship on the East Coast and was driving with a boyfriend across the country in a car that had jumbo tires on it. Tires that were advertised as being blowout proof. But in Wyoming, one of the tires blew out. The car careened out of control, rolled over and over, and Peggy broke her back. I was only eight years old, but remember when, on a stormy night, a runner came to camp at Marble Mount, where Daddy was building the North Cascades Highway, to tell my parents of the accident. They both immediately left, and Mother did not return home for three months. Peggy was taken to Detroit for treatment, and there, for the second time in her life, she was forced to lie quietly on her back. 
She carved figures in soap to help pass the endless hours. But as she held them overhead, she often found this very frustrating as the soap shavings fell back in her eyes. I vividly remember when they brought Peggy back to Tacoma on the train. She was on a stretcher and they had to take her off the train through the window. Slowly she was able to sit up and started her painting once more, but she never recovered any feeling below her armpits. Peggy sued the tire company and won, but that did not cure her paralysis. She would not be daunted, however. She learned to drive a car with her hands and even pursued her love of the hunt. But now she was bouncing across the Tacoma prairies in her convertible rather than on the back of a horse. Painting was her passion, however, and she pursued that most of her waking hours. She joined a class with Mark Toby before he became famous. And she also studied with Sarkis Sarkishan, a prominent Armenian Detroit painter who came to Tacoma to teach Peggy. Peggy painted his wife as she sat on our front terrace. Portraits remained her main source of income during these years, and even when she had no commissions, she would prevail upon maybe our gardener, her sisters, and even our boyfriends to pose for her. I can remember being irritated as heck to have to sit there on a beautiful day for my sister to paint me. Peggy's first big recognition came when, with Mountain Merry-Go-Round, she won first place in the Seattle Art Museum annual show. Kenneth Callahan, curator of the Seattle Art Museum, wrote, Miss Strong displays a high degree of skill because she can handle any subject with equal ease, painting it with surety and directness in fluid, swinging brush strokes. But although some of her paintings were considered modern, Peggy was mainly a figurative painter, and the Seattle Art Museum was focusing more and more on abstract art. So Peggy's award-winning painting was relegated to the basement. It has never been shown again, except when all past winners of the Northwest Annual were shown, and ironically, on a folder to raise money for the art museum. Peggy admired the artistry of New York painter Frederick Taubus, and it was from him that she learned to grind her own paints from raw pigments and to mix her own varnishes. During the Depression, as part of the federal efforts to put artists back to work, the U.S. Treasury Department sponsored murals and post offices. Peggy heard of the competition for a mural in the Wenatchee Post Office and entered a design. And we asked her, Peggy, how on earth will you be able to paint a big mural? And she said, oh, well, I won't win it. Well, she did. And this was in competition with 50 other artists, many best-known Northwest painters such as Kenneth Callahan and Guy Anderson. My father built her a platform, and with a pulley and chain, we hauled her up and down so she could paint. According to art historian Sharon Barney, Peggy Strong's mural is perhaps one of the best examples nationally, in part because Strong achieved a remarkably complex composition, both in use of space and combination of information. The mural was acquisitioned by Smithsonian and can be seen at the North Central Washington Museum in Wenatchee. Before installing the mural, the Seattle Art Museum showed it and they also had a retrospective show of her portraits and still life paintings. Several times more abstract work won the prize, 
but Peggy won the most popular vote. We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. During World War II, Peggy was commissioned to paint two additional murals to cheer the troops. One was of Paul Bunyan and his blue ox in the Tacoma Union Railroad Station. The other in Dutch Harbor Officers Club. When the Tacoma Station was renovated, the Paul Bunyan mural was moved to a safe haven at the Student Union Building at the University of Puget Sound. But I don't know what happened to the mural that was in Dutch Harbor. Peggy always had many male admirers, but she decided since she was in a wheelchair, it was really unfair to marry. It must have been hard for her to see her three sisters all marry. What kept her going with buoyancy was her sense of humor. This was often expressed in the Christmas card she created. She would design them, and then the family would help fill in the paint where it was needed. Here's my father supporting my mother with her political activity. She was always a very strong Democrat. My father was a conservative Republican. And she put her two youngest daughters, my sister and me, to work handing out literature. And there's my brother, a civil engineer in San Francisco. And my other sister, who was in San Francisco working. And here's Peggy putting up her own mural. a later painting, which seems to me to be a combination of her humorous stick figures. She got mother's sense of democracy, and way before people were painting people of color, Peggy was. Peggy not only drove her car with her hands, but often pulled a large house trailer behind, and off she went with a helper to Oregon. During this period of her life, her art was described by one critic as having clean modeling, strong color, and a robust sense of humor. Peggy also drove her car to New York, and along the way she painted portraits. In New York, she became a member of Portraits Incorporated. Her paintings were being accepted at museum shows across the country, such as the Sisters at the exclusive Virginia Biennial, and Elizabeth at the Cincinnati Annual, and later at a show at the San Francisco Art Museum. The reviewer for the Christian Science Monitor wrote about the winner, but added, a more thoroughly masterful canvas without benefit of award is Peggy Strong's sensitive portrait, Elizabeth. Another reviewer wrote, a portrait in oil along normal lines is a refreshing oasis among the radical sand dunes.
Peggy's April Transplant won the Junior League competition for the front cover of their national magazine. She also won first with Walter in their annual art competition in Memphis, Tennessee. Most important, she was one of 60 women in the nation asked to exhibit at the San Francisco World's Fair. Lady in Green attracted numbers of reviews and attention and was later chosen to represent the state of Washington in a show at Rockefeller Center. Peggy was very generous. She had a friend who had also broken her back but did not have resources for a car, so Peggy bought her a car. Peggy was determined to walk again. She was fitted with braces and able to straighten her legs and pull herself up against the car door. My father was there to encourage her, but she toppled easily. She went east to the best surgeons and even tried England and a faith healer there, who, at a large public meeting, became livid with her because she could not get up and walk when he commanded her to do so. I've often wondered if this painting wasn't in response to such a traumatic experience. Her trip to Europe seemed to bring forth a new type of darker, sometimes surrealistic, and often poignant paintings. Peggy moved to San Francisco, where she lived in an apartment on Telegraph Hill. The press loved her, and she was doing fine living alone with a helper coming in during the day. But it was here that she had another very troubling experience. The young woman helping Peggy lost her mind and threatened Peggy with a butcher knife. Fortunately, a friend of Peggy's dropped by and rescued her. The young woman escaped and was later found nearby dancing naked in the street. Soon after that incident, Peggy moved to Palo Alto, where she was artist-in-residence at Allied Arts. My sister Bibbets Brown lived nearby, and although Bibbets was very busy raising a family, she did spend a lot of time with Peggy and helped her a lot. That was good because by this time, relations between Mother and Peggy had begun to unravel. Peggy fought for total independence, and in so doing, I think hurt Mother. Mother compensated and started her own life of travel at the age of 70. And travel she did until she was 90 years old. <laughs> Everywhere Mother went, she made friends, and I think it was a very happy time of her life. Peggy, in the meanwhile, had met Howard Thurman, named by Life magazine in 1953 as one of the 12 great preachers of the 20th century. He was also an important mentor to Martin Luther King. Peggy was probing deeply into life issues and took copious notes on the varied philosophical, religious, and psychological books she read. Thurman visited her once a week, and they had challenging discussions of these topics. She also provided him with paint so he could paint. In Thurman's autobiography, he wrote of Peggy, a superbly gifted artist and portrait painter, she was one of the most resourceful human beings I have ever known. One of the fruits of our long and rich friendship is her portrait of me. This was the last portrait Peggy would paint. Peggy wrote a long memoir, but one day, because she feared it might hurt Mother, Peggy burned it. Oh, would that I had that memoir, so I could more accurately know what exactly Peggy was thinking. Peggy finds
finally came to the realization she would never marry or walk again. Her work seems to reflect her state of mind, and one does not need to look far to find what gave her the idea for some of these paintings. Her intense religious seeking is also reflected in her often allegorical paintings. This painting, called Paradox, is one of my favorites. I don't know whether Peggy intended to give this message, but this painting reminds me that often when I'm despondent, the answer is right beside me in nature. For over 65 years, Peggy was dropped from the Northwest art scene. It's a joy to see her revival not just because of her paintings, but because she was my beloved sister, who not only stole my boyfriends, but gave me inspiration and guidance for the rest of my life. <laughs>